thank you so much for letting me be part of this community. I, one of the nicest things um, I learned when I was starting Honest Tea, someone told me one of the nicest things you can say to somebody is that they have a lot of tea in them. It means that they have a sense of balance, a sense of peace, and, and a sense of purpose. And this is, a, this is a community that has a lot of tea in it. And I, so I love to be with it. And of course, if you don't have enough tea, there's plenty more in the back. <laughs> I want to share with you our story. I want to talk about the lessons we've learned and, and the struggle that um, we continue to be engaged in. And that really means all of us continue to be engaged in. So first of all, just to give you a sense of place, Honesty is based in Bethesda, Maryland. It's, it's where I live. Uh, Bethesda is just across the border from Washington, D.C. It's not the typical place where consumer brands are built. Um, in Bethesda, it's, or in D.C., as you know, it's more political brands. But every once in a while, there's an interesting co coincidence of, uh, of brand and politics. And so we're happy to see um, this shot. This was taken just about a year ago with President Obama. And you'll notice on the corner of the Resolute desk, there's a bottle of honest tea. Uh, <laughs> so the president is a loyal uh, consumer. Someone had said to me, well, you know, it would have been ideal if the bottle had been rotated so that you could see the tea. So, well, it wouldn't have been honest to Photoshop that. Um, <laughs> but, but um, you know, it's interesting because you, you don't often see presidents with brands. They're, they're, they and their handlers are pretty meticulous about keeping them separated, and, and yet um, we know that he is, is frequently sp spotted with honest tea bottle nearby. So as Bud mentioned, honest tea, uh, we wrote a comic book. This is just an excerpt from it, but... Um, we wanted to tell the story in a way that made it more accessible. And, and the way Honest Tea started was in the classroom. That in the top left is my co-founder, Barry. Uh, and that's supposed to be me in the bottom right-hand corner. And it started at the Yale School of Management, where we were talking about the beverage industry. And we were talking about what was missing, or where were the opportunities. And, and it was so clear at the time, 1995, that um, there were all these sweet drinks, 100 calories per 8-ounce serving. And when Barry said, what's missing, my hand went up and said, there's nothing with just you know, one or two teaspoons of sugar. And I ran track in college and uh, was always thirsty and there was nothing to drink. And so Barry was excited. He said, let's make some samples. And I said, you know, I've, I've <laughs> I'm excited about the idea, but I got to find a job. So um, I went to work for Calvert Funds in Bethesda, Maryland. I um, was involved in the sales and marketing for the socially responsible part of the portfolio. Um, but the idea stuck with me. And a few years later, after giving a presentation in New York to some institutional investors, went for a run and was still thirsty. There was still nothing there. And then I reached out to Barry and I said, I think I'm ready to do something about this. He had just come up with the name Honest Tea. He had been in India. He had um, studied the tea industry and had come up with a name. And for me, that all of a sudden felt like the, the clouds were parting. That made sense, um, gave a sense of purpose to the brand. And, and, it, and so we, we filed for the trademark. And it's funny, when we filed, we registered um, for two different trademarks. One was Honest T, the two words, and then the other was H-O-N-E-S-T-E-A. And within a few days of that application, we heard back from um, Nestie's trademark lawyer who said, we see your application, um, but we're not comfortable with you applying for the name Ho Nestie. Um, you know, <laughs> that's, <laughs> I said, well, well, we hadn't thought about it that way, but. <laughs> now that you mention it, we will withdraw our application for Ho Nest Tea, and we will um, just go to market with Honest Tea, and, and that was how we secured the trademark. And, and so um, I left my job at Calvert. Um, I brewed five thermoses of tea in, in my kitchen in Bethesda, and I went to the Whole Foods regional office in Rockville, Maryland, uh, with a paste, uh, an empty Snapple bottle we'd pasted a label on. So we want to sell this in your store. And to you know, our great <laughs> delight and terror, they said, yeah, we'll take 15,000 bottles. And so uh, we figured out how to make the tea, and we were in business. And um, it has been uh, an adventure along the way. I'm going to gloss over most of the painful parts because I don't want to go back to the, the trauma of it. But um, I will share with you a bit about our innovation and, and how we've evolved. What happened is that as we grew, we became the best-selling tea in the natural foods world. But we reached, a, we were approaching a ceiling about what, what could happen. We were um, getting approached by large national chains, and we, were, we didn't have the distribution in place to, to, to take advantage of those opportunities. The beverage world is so distribution um, focused because these are large, bo it's, it's bottles, you can't ship it through the mail. Of course, glass bottles wouldn't make sense either. And so we reached this wall where we either had to um, <laughs> sort of go big or stay niche. And the, and the go big meant, you know, going into stores like Safeway uh, and, and CVS or staying in the natural channel. 
When we talk about ourselves as a mission-driven company, for us, our mission really does drive our decision-making, all decision-making, what products we bring out, what our growth strategy is. And we said, if we're serious about this mission, um, one of the key pillars of our mission is democratizing organics, not just selling healthy foods to healthy people. We love healthy people. We love um, you know, uh, the healthy channel. But we have to make these available wherever people are. And so we were approached um, at the same as we were growing by several companies. We partnered with Coca-Cola. And this is the slide that Coke shared with their board in um, convincing them to make the, invest, the decision to invest in honesty. And I'll just share with you what this means. So they talk about the honest brand being positioned um, at the intersection of three lifestyles, sort of the mega trends, not just not just low-carb diets, but a bigger picture. So, you know, you've got the, the direction of health and wellness. You've got the environmental movement towards environmental consciousness and social responsibility. And there's that small white triangle in the middle where they all overlap. That space where a business tries to, uh, you know, uh, make decisions and take actions that, that balance all three of those. And the recognition was that in 2007, that was a small space. But if you look five years out, or of course now eight years out, the standard for doing business will be that every company is expected to operate in that space. Of course, in this audience, I know you all you know, internalize that. But for a company like Coca-Cola, it was an important recognition that that's where the future is. And so the investment in honest tea wasn't just an investment in tea or organic or lower calorie drinks. It was an investment in a new approach to doing business. And so um, Coke invested in about 40% of the company in 2008. And then they bought the rest of the company in 2011. And as you may uh, know, most of the time when, especially a company like Coke buys a, uh, a, a brand, the founders don't stick around. I'm friendly with the, uh, found the person who, who was president of Vitamin Water. And I was, you know, they, had, they sold to Coke in, uh, before us, and he was already gone by the time I got, by the time we did our deal. He said, yeah, you know, you know the first three months, they want to know your opinion. The next three months, they want to know your phone number. After that, they don't want to know you. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I... So why am I still here? Well, there's a few reasons. Number one, we were a much earlier stage company um, with a lot of uh, upside still ahead and a lot of growth and a lot of challenges. Number two, our first 10 years of growth were so brutal. Um, we had so many struggles to get distribution. We literally, <laughs> in, the, in the book, there was a scene of Barry you know, begging on his knees to, for someone to distribute our product. Uh, I, <laughs> I didn't get to that, but I was very um, persistent, really seeking out distribution. And so to finally have the chance now to, to have that just all the, the things we've been working for for the first 10 years finally are, were becoming possible. And I didn't want to you know, step away from that. And then uh, certainly uh, most important is uh, it's not a knock on Coke. It's not a, a, anyone in particular, but I didn't want this to be screwed up. I've seen so many brands. You know, usually when a company sells to a, a large um, national chain, that's the peak of their innovation. That's the peak of their mission. And it's generally downhill from there. And we all know the companies that sort of lose their fire, lose their edge. And so I knew that if we were going to do this, <coughs> it was going to, we were, it was very early innings for the brand. And that the, the, the biggest impact could still be ahead if it was handled right. And so I want to share with you a bit about what we did and how we've done it and some of the challenges we faced along the way. So first of all, the biggest impact was distribution. When we started with Coke, um, when they first invested, we were in 15,000 stores. Today, we're in actually over 120,000 stores. So when we talk about democratizing organics, we talk about our reach. It means we're getting to people who, who uh, whether it's in convenience stores, in restaurants, places where organic beverages just weren't available. One of the um, key ways to look at it is growth. So our sales curve has been nice. And we talk about you know, the whole um, discussion. The theme of this conference is breakthroughs. And you know, I was just thinking, for honesty, our breakthrough was working with Coca-Cola. Um, because you can see how our growth at 2008 does take a steeper incline and, and is still going. Um, but for us, the, what fuels the growth? It's not just distribution. It really is the pillars of our mission. And so our mission is based on promoting health and wellness, reducing our environmental footprint, creating economic opportunity in communities that don't have access to it, maintaining transparency, and building community. And so when we go back to that sales curve, what's really happened there is that um, it's all about new products. That's, how we, that's what's fueled our growth. So we were the first to do a lightly sweetened tea. We were the first to make organic bottled tea, the first to make fair trade certified um, tea, and continuing to innovate. And I remember at the time we announced our deal with Coca-Cola in 2008, 
I, um, one of the first meetings I had was with Walter Robb at Expo West. And I sat down and I said, Walter, I can promise you nothing's going to change. We're going to be selling you the exact same product we were selling. And he said, that's <laughs> exactly what I don't want to hear. You've always been the innovator. You've always been the one willing to take risks. I need you to continue to do those risks. I need you to continue to push what you're doing. And that was a great challenge. And it was one that I certainly um, took to heart because for us, we knew um, that's how you keep your edge. And so we have brought out a lot of new products, not all of which have succeeded, for sure. Some of the red, whoops, um, uh, some of them have just failed outright, but a lot of them are in, things that haven't been done before. The first organic zero-calorie soda. Um, for those of you who haven't yet tried this new um, zero-calorie herbal tea, it's the first of its kind. So we're continuing to bring new ingredients and new uh, innovations, as well as deepening what we've done. And one of the best ways to look at our mission is along the three, the three key pillars around organic. So um, when Coke first invested, we had 29 organic varieties, now we have 44. When Coke first invested, we had seven fair trade varieties. It was about a third of our line. Now all of our um, teas are fair trade certified, and 34 of them uh, are fully fair trade. And then uh, two zero calorie varieties when Coke first invested, now we're at 13. So for us, we've absolutely been able to increase what, what we've done. <laughs> what about in terms of the impact to the communities? Well, when Coke first invested, we were buying 800,000 pounds of organic ingredients. And um, just in last year, 6.7 million pounds of ingre organic ingredients. So now when we go to these communities and we talk about organic, it's not some guy who started his um, company out of his house in Bethesda, Maryland, saying, oh, you know, we believe in organic and fair trade. It is um, a representative of the world's largest beverage company. And every country in the world knows what Coca-Cola is. And when we say this is an important part of our growth, um, and if you want to be our customer, you have to be organic. You have to be fair trade certified. It really um, gets their attention in a different way. And I'll just quickly give you the, the health reasons to think about um, organic tea. So tea leaves, unlike uh, most organic, mo most, most produce, most produce is washed and rinsed. Tea leaves are one of the few products that are never rinsed. They're picked and they're dried. So if any chemicals are sprayed on tea leaves, and it's fair to assume in, in a lot of the developing world that there's not, <laughs> there are, we know there are chemicals sprayed on these leaves. Um, those chemicals stay on the leaves until hot water is poured on the leaves, and the hot water basically washes any chemicals right into the, the, the tea that you would drink. So uh, for us, it was very simple to say, well, we need to have um, tea leaves that are clean, and not to mention the fact that um, the people picking the tea leaves literally are up to their shoulders in the bushes. So they're fully immersed in whatever chemicals there are or aren't there. Um, and for us, organic has been absolutely a key driver of our brand and our identity. I wanted to um, talk a bit about fair trade as well. So we, were, um, we went to fair trade tea fairly early, but we went to fair trade sugar fairly recently. And um, it, is, it is, so it's only in the past two years. And well, actually what drove it, another great example of our partnership with Whole Foods, um, we wanted to, um, we talked with Whole Foods about creating their summer lemonade line. They said, we like um, your products, but we need it to be fair trade, made with fair trade sugar. And we didn't have, um, we had not sort of fully understood the supply chain for fair trade sugar. And um, we developed a partnership. We went down, I went down to Paraguay and um, set up a relationship with a cooperative there that makes fair trade sugar. I'm going to show you a little in a second what it means. But for us, it was a great example of um, we started with this one product with Whole Foods and over the past two years have um, brought fair trade sugar to the full um, assortment of our products. So I'm going to show you this video. It, there's an interesting, some interesting insights around exactly how um, you can, how you are able to, what organic means in these communities, because you can't, you still need pesticides, but you'll see they have a different form of controlling the pests. So let's roll the video on um, Paraguay. We had a lot of goals when we launched Honest Tea. The first was to bring a low calorie drink to market and make it widely available. But another was to find ways to help connect people more closely to the natural world and to support ecosystems that are really under, under threat. So we're in Paraguay, which is the world's largest producer of organic cane sugar. We've come here to gain a fuller appreciation of the communities and the ecosystem that help us bring this crop to market. That, it goes on my shoulder. <laughs> like that? Nice. I like to get my hands dirty, literally. I mean, obviously I'm not working eight hours a day like these workers are in, in the field, but it helps make sure that I never take for granted all that's involved in, in you know, getting these products out of the earth and getting them into a, a bottle of tea. 
There we go. <laughs> Putting up the seed cane. It helps uh, start, the, start the, the germination. Sugar cane is a vital part of the Paraguayan economy. And each year, more farmers are making the switch to organic. It starts from the ground up with natural fertilizers cultivated in this compost field and continues in the lab where these researchers are developing alternatives to chemical pesticides by breeding tiny wasps to control cane worms. When we can see a school like this that really is supported by or a commitment to organic and fair trade, that really makes uh, a material difference in this community. Cinco, cuatro, tres, dos, uno, cero! <laughs> Every time we buy a pound of fair trade sugar, a portion of our purchase goes back to the farmers. And sometimes these premiums are used to buy ambulances and modern farm equipment that helps the farmers increase yields. And sometimes they go to help community members who need an extra hand. They have a small plantation of cane, organic cane. This is the original house that uh, this family lived in, and it, it's a very basic construction, literally sticks and mud and a dirt floor. But they've been working in this field for 60 years, and so what's nice now is that the cooperative uh, provided them with a, uh, came and built a house for them. You know, it's so easy when you see a product on the shelf to just be disconnected not only from the, the earth and the ecosystem it comes from, but also from the people involved. At the end of the day, making a better product is about more than just better taste. It's also about long-term investments in the environment, the farmers, and their communities. So one of the um, nice, thank you. <laughs> So one of the really exciting developments, so as I said, we brought out uh, fair trade sugar first to our glass bottle line, the one we sold on the Natural Foods Channel, um, and, and, and to our lemonade. Um, and then we, um, just this year, uh, we brought it, we made the decision to bring it out to our entire line, to our plastic bottle as well. And what's neat about that is the plastic bottle is now managed by the Water Tea Coffee Group. So this wasn't a decision that I forced <laughs> down their throats. Normally, I, I, that's my job. <laughs> But um, they came to me and said, we want to make this fair trade certified. It's going to add at least $250,000 to the annual cost of goods for this product line. The, the, the stereotype, of course, is large corporations are all about stripping out cost of goods, cheapening the product, and, and increasing their marketing spend. Uh, and this was the exact opposite. And it was great to have that decision. Really, um, I, I applauded and supported the decision, but I wasn't the, the, the driver of that decision, which is really neat. But let me go back. I want to talk about some of the tensions. What are the challenges? Well, um, one of the um, early points of friction with Coca-Cola was around a product line called Honest Kids. This was a product line that has um, just been a runaway train for us. In 2000, I, I have three boys. I, um, was, I wa they're all now flown the coop, but when I was when they were at home, I was their lunch maker, and it usually involved putting things in a lunchbox that were prepackaged. I'm being honest, <laughs> um, and I was my middle son said to me one day, said, "Dad, you know, you sell healthy drinks to grown-ups, but um, these drinks pouches that you put in my lunchbox are really sugary." It was a hundred-calorie drink pouch. It was the um, one that was most people were buying, and I realized it has more sugar per ounce than a can of soda, and that was what I was putting in my kids' lunchbox. So. Uh, we came out with a product called Honest Kids. 40 calories, organic, um, and uh, it's, it started off to do very well in 2007. When we started partnering with Coke, um, they looked at the package and they said, we're, we want to sell this in our warehouse, but we're not comfortable with the language that says no high fructose corn syrup on the box. Um, and so uh, they said, if you want to sell that, if you want us to sell that product, we're going to have to get rid of that language. And I said, well, I... Um, would love for you to sell it, but we can't take that off the product. That's one of the key messages about being a less processed ingredient. And in fact, by the time they were selling it, it said, you know, organic, no high fructose corn syrup, exclamation point. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> so um, th that uh, request got escalated, and I met with one of the chief scientific people who explained to me the science behind high fructose corn syrup and sugar. I said, I, I'm not a scientist, I, I, so I'm, I won't argue with you about that. I can tell you, uh, I do know this consumer, I know this customer, I know this is an important point, so it can't come off. 
And that in turn got escalated. I guess if we're in a confidential setting, it got escalated as high as it goes. And I sat down in front of a, a chief executive and I said, we, we appreciate this partnership, um, but this can't come off. This is part of our brand. It's part of what we sell. And I know you in the short term want me to take this off, but in the long term you don't want me to take this off because we're trying to do something different here. And so uh, uh, at, at the time, Coke was a minority investor. And they said, well, a deal's a deal, so um, you'll keep it on. And uh, <laughs> what we did do in uh, 2012, we took out all of the sugar that was sweetening um, Honest Kids, and we sweetened it only with fruit juice. And we realized that that messaging was actually more important than the messaging around high fructose corn syrup. We do have on the side of the panel, it says no high fructose corn syrup, so we still have <laughs> the messaging. But here's what's happened to Honest Kids in the interim. This is what's happened to the category. The red line is the category. The green line is what's happened to Honest Kids. Um, it has just totally gone against all the trends. And, and, and I think for the general population, it's really exciting. And if you look at the kids category now, um, all of the drinks have come down in calories. And <laughs> the big blue brand that, was, um, my, that I used to buy, their main, when you look at their pop package now, the main message is you think the brand is called No High Fructose Corn Syrup, uh, <laughs> because that's how they're marketing it. I want to take you through another um, uh, example of well, where Honest Kids now has gone is uh, we just launched Honest Kids at Wendy's. Um, so now, 6,000 restaurants around the country, children have access to uh, organic, uh, lower sugar juice drink. And we also have just launched um, Honest Brew Tea at Wendy's. And in fact, today, as a, as a, a tribute to that partnership, um, later in this talk, we're going to be giving out samples of uh, food from Wendy's, at, or drinks from Wendy's at least. Um, no, not food, just the tea. Uh, <laughs> um, but really exciting for us, we talk about democratizing organics, and it was a funny negotiation we had with Wendy's because, um, you know, we, we met with them and they said, well, we really think our customers like sweet tea. And I said, well, you know, then you don't want our tea. And then they said, but I knew, I, inside I really wanted to work with Wendy's, but they said, well, we know, um, okay, well, we get that, but we really need a, a tea that meets our cost standards. It has to meet a certain price point. I said, well, then, you know, organic costs more. There's no way around it. And fair trade costs more. And they said, okay. And so it, was, um, it wasn't really a negotiation. We just, they, they basically came around to what we were offering. And uh, it's been really exciting to see how it's grown. Um, what about on our main package? So this was where we were in 2008. And um, there, Coke provided us with research that said this package is recessive. It's not... Um, this is our top selling SKU, but it wasn't doing as well as it could. The name is hard to recognize, the ingredients are a little... Um, and, and we thought, we recognized they were right. Then we did some design work, and they came up with this design. And this tested incredibly well. This, this was like through the roof on the tests. And I said, well, congratulations, I and mean, it's great to see we've gotten a good test, but this doesn't feel right for our brand. So feel free to use this design for some other product. It's not, <laughs> not right. And so we ended up with this, which was better, but still didn't really, um, and the product was doing okay. And then, um, one of the challenges, you deal with different marketing people who come in, and so they often want to shake things up. So we had a, uh, an effort that was led that um, somebody was presenting this design, and you notice no T. Uh, and we were actually very close to launching this. And I just had one of those midnight gut checks, and I said, this isn't right. And I said, I'm not going to be the, I'm certainly not going to be the person who takes the T off of Honest T. And I said, I don't think you want to be that person either. Um, and we ended up with this. And, and uh, it certainly worked. But it was, it, was a, it was a scary moment in retrospect because we were that close to, to, to leaving sort of you know, where our origins had been. And the impact of this package, though, has been phenomenal. Um, so now, um, just this year, Honesty has grown over 32% in Nielsen, um, six times faster than the category, and our velocity is up 25 points. So... The, with the restage. So it's a really, um, we've, I think we got it right. It was, it was challenging, but we, I appreciate that Coke pushed us, and I appreciate that they basically let me continue to have the final say, which I feel very good about where it, where it ended up. Um, one of the other things we've done that really helps keep, our, keep it on, is keep it different, is our own marketing. And we are we're very fortunate that one of our um, local field marketers is here in Austin. And I want to share with you one of the um, things that we do that is our way of connecting with consumers. It is a, it's a different um, type of connection. And so we, every year, perform an annual honesty test, a test of the nation's honesty. We put up racks of tea, we put up a sign that says a dollar a bottle in honor system, and then we just step back and we see how honest people are. 
I'm going to show you the results of the test, but any guesses? How honest do you think people are? What percent of people would pay for a bottle of tea when no one's looking? Any guesses? What's a guess? 50%, okay, so it's a fair guess. Um, I'm going to show you the results of the test, but in addition to watching the experiment, of course, pay attention to the marketing. Think about the marketing benefit of this campaign, which costs us about, it was about a um, $600,000 sort of experiment. We'll show the video. We seek to have this direct and honest relationship with our ingredients. And so we wanted to perform a test to see how much our consumers embrace those same values. This is a genius way to promote your brand because you are all Thank about you. honesty within your products. Tonight for America's Most Honest City, it comes from the folks who make honest tea. Honest tea, which if you've ever tried, is delicious. But since they have honest in their title, what they did was they went to 27 different cities across America. Atlanta, Georgia, you get the bragging rights, 100% honesty. Maybe it's that southern hospitality. Providence, Rhode Island is at the bottom for the second year in a row with one guy even paying with a fake million dollar bill. Shame, shame. And only one city had people actually take money out of the box. That was where our lawmakers are, Washington, D.C. Other interesting <laughs> notes, women with and those with brown hair were found to be the most honest, the least honest, bald people. Yep. <laughs> What about bald people who once had brown hair? <laughs> this is a refreshingly honest take on how honest people are. 94% of people around the country put money in the box when no one was looking. If you're put in one of those what would you do type situations mm -hmm. today, maybe make the right choice. You know, the one that your mom would want you to make. There you go. So this experiment, we've been doing this for five years in a row. Every year, the results are basically the same. And yet, every year, we just keep getting more and more coverage of it. it is a, it's a refreshingly honest story. Uh, and and um, especially in the summer when, you know, think about all the bad news we had this summer. Um, it's like, wow, okay, you can actually feel better about people. And, and uh, it's a fun, it's one of our, you know, what we talk about in Coke language, they talk about as one of our properties. Um, so, <laughs> all right, so I want to just um, try to wrap this up. What is, why is this working? Why, why um, and I, by no means is this perfect, and, and we're not scot-free, but why do we feel like we've been, you know, putting this in the right direction? So I think one of the keys was a phased-in acquisition. Um, for the first three years, we really were operating independently. Coke was at the table, but they weren't controlling us. We got to show that we could lead this business with integrity and, and still keep it, you know, with the brand intact. Um, another thing that's important is continued engagement from the founding team. We're still based in Bethesda. I still kept a personal equity stake in the company, which certainly keeps me focused on um, making smart decisions with the brand and with our budget. Um, and I think another key thing is our brand equity isn't based on um, touchy-feely. There, there are third-party verified claims, so the USDA organic seal, federally enforced seal. Uh, that with an object objective def definition of what organic is. Fair Trade USA, verified by a third party with an objective definition of what, and financial re you know, requirements to be part of uh, Fair Trade certification. And then finally, um, we report annually, and we included an excerpt. This is only an excerpt. There's a 20-page online mission report, but uh, uh, every year we report on our impact and, our, and, and where our challenges are, where we need to improve. Um, but continuing to do that, um, something that's really important. We know before we got bought by Coke, we didn't report on it. We were sort of relying on people's um, trust. And I think uh, these days, trust but verify is what you need to do when you're part of a larger company. And let me just put it, uh, by the way, we got President Obama to pose with the tea facing out in the bottle, as you can see over there. <laughs> so let me put, put it in a bigger picture. I'm going to share with you um, two different pro bottle cap quotes. They're both Chinese proverbs. If we don't change the direction we are headed, we will end up where we are going. So where are we going? Well, it's a truism, of course, but where are we going? We're, we're going in the wrong direction. When the United uh, Nations ranks the annual life expectancy of all the countries in the world, um, they do it every few years. In 2010, they ranked it, and even though the United States is the wealthiest nation in the history of the world, even though we have more advanced knowledge of science and medicine and nutrition than any civilization has ever had, when it came to ranking average life expectancy, we weren't number one, we weren't number two, we were number 40. 
I'm somebody who is incredibly um, thankful to be part of this country and benefited from its entrepreneurial system, but I'm ashamed to live in a country and a society that lets that happen. It means we have the wrong priorities, the wrong lifestyles, the wrong relationship to the natural world, the wrong, re wrong relationship to each other. And the existing status quo is headed in that direction. That's, that's why we're, we're there. And it's not going to change unless um, people like you start to make a change. And the big companies won't initiate the change, but they will absolutely buy into the change because they see the business opportunity. In a sense, they're buying low. I mean, 40th, the people are literally not living up to their potential. So it is a great buying opportunity, a great investing opportunity. But it's not easy work, and I know all of you recognize that as well. And just as when we talked about um, when we were growing honesty, you, you, you can't build a brand that respects the, 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 the intelligence of the consumer you can't, or, the, or sort of tries to take the health of the consumer into mind. There are those people who say you can't scale a, a mission-driven brand inside a large multinational that's profit-driven. And to both of those people, we, I'll share with you this last quote. This is on the wall of Honesty's office in Bethesda. Those who say it cannot be done should not interrupt the people doing it. <laughs> and I'm so proud and so thankful to be part of a community that's doing it. Thank you very much.